And two thanks to the Challenger Society. Uh, the first is um, helping us put this book together, which I've talked to some of you about already, and I'm not going to spend time on that. I'm probably not going to talk on the art at all, because I shall run out of time, uh, almost certainly. Um, also, thank you very much for the opportunity to come along and talk on a subject which sort of interests me. I say sort of interests me because, having said yes, I would do it, more or less every day afterwards I regretted it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we've all gone through that. But th this is a particular one, and uh, I should warn you that uh, essentially what I thought I would do, in essence, is a biography of this man, Heckel. We'll talk a little about him uh, later on. But if you do a biography, you're driven by the subject itself. itself. Uh, and this dragged me into two things, fighting and screaming. One is embryology, and the other is eugenics. Now, I had not expected this, uh, and in fact, if I found that I, ha that I was going to do that, I would have probably said no at the beginning. And try as I may, I can't get rid of this. It, it, it's, it's there, it's central to what he did, and central to so many things. But fortunately, uh, Heckel was a very brazen character. That fortunate probably isn't the right word at that point in time. But he, he managed to pick a fight with uh, a oceanographer at Keele University. And so I've got a little bit of oceanography I can talk about. <laughs> but much of it is going to be really about how science developed during that time and also the interaction between a scientist and the community around him. Um, so hopefully this isn't too far off your uh, aims, Matthew, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, he's been called everything. In fact, the only thing I can find him not accused of is misogyny. <laughs> so if there's anyone in the audience who'd like to help, I'm sure we can go through his works and find something to accuse him of that. Um, we kept out the proto-Nazi in the title because <clears throat> we thought it might, since these things are advertised, uh, we might have had a few unwelcome subscriptions to the Challenger <laughs> Society. Um, Heckel was probably one of the, certainly one of the leading biologists uh, in Germany during the latter part of the 1800s. Um, internationally, he was probably more important than Darwin uh, in promoting uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. He was very, very, very influential. Um, was a producer of a number of words that we're familiar with, metazoa, ecology, protozoa, we're talking protista, monera, and stem cell. Now, I only realised this a few months ago, and I could never understand where the word stem cell came from. I imagine that it had a little thing coming off it. But it doesn't, we'll see, it comes from uh, the way that Heckel portrayed the, the uh, association of organisms in, uh, in evolution. And um, a number of Theories is, oh, just while we're with stem cell, he actually did very early stem cell research. And we're talking now about 1862. Uh, and this has just been recognised quite recently. Um, he put forward a number of theories, one called the gastrula theory, which I'd never heard of before. Recapitulation, some of you will have come across, and that's rather central uh, to Heckel as a character. And he defined uh, the separate function of the nucleus and the cytoplasm in the cell. Uh, and that's very crucial. He Huxley, at about the same time, two years later actually, this was 66, uh, and in 68, uh, Huxley defined protoplasm. So it was a very, very, so I'll show you in a minute, it was a very, very dynamic period uh, in the evolution of biological ideas. Um, the World Catalogue gives you a time uh, marker, uh, and uh, this is the orange bands here are his publications. And he lived from, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about his biography in a minute, up to 1919. And he didn't slow up at all. Uh, this was work written about him, uh, and this is, no, beg your pardon. That's right. This is what written about. This is publications associated with him, and um, 
We're right up to date on this, as I was explaining to some people. Just a week or so, another book was produced. Oh, th that's right. And it's a pop-up book on plankton. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think we, should, we biologists should throw the gauntlet down to the physical oceanographers and say, when are you going to do a pop-up book on <laughs> ocean dynamics? <laughs> I think that would be easier than marine chemistry, actually. <laughs> uh, plate tectonics is, 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 is a possibility, but uh, I had hoped to bring it along. I, I nagged the publishers, and I should, they promised to have a copy with me. It's probably at home on the, uh, on the porch floor at the present. But, uh. Now, this is a summary of very good uh, author, Robert J. Richards. Um, I got a Pulitzer Prize for his book on Darwin, actually. And he makes this point that Haeckel was a great populizer uh, of science, as was Huxley, very similar individuals, both of them quite abrasive, but Haeckel even more so. At one stage, Huxley told him to cool it. <laughs> well, if a man like Huxley says, look, don't be uh, so abrasive, you're obviously really hitting the high spots. Um, and the argument is this, this aim to popularize the work really put his, put his science in jeopardy. And I think that's a concern that a lot of the people who are scientists have, that if I turn to that, it might do me scientific damage. But also, uh, this man makes a point, the negligent attitude uh, of subsequent scholars. And that is, I think, very, very relevant as well. So the structure of the talk, I put it in inverted commas because I'm not entirely sure it's got a structure. Um, and I'm just going to run through this. You don't need to read the data details. I'm going to base it on basically four books. Two of them, uh, a group of us have had, uh, in fact, three, three of them, a look at the, this afternoon. Yes, I'm pressing the wrong thing. Uh, the Radio Laren, uh, where is it? Oh, oh, right, Art Forms in Nature. And we looked at another one, actually, which isn't up there. And then I want to talk about the two controversies. Uh, the one with Henson, very... Uh, eminent uh, oceanographer at, at Kiel, and then <laughs> he really got up the nose of the Brits uh, <laughs> in a wonderful way. And as we see, the empire struck back, um, um, which is the, the first is ironic because he had very, very close English friends. Uh, and I've tried to sort out the history of this, but I've not really been fully successful. Um, right, where are we now? That's him. He's quite a handsome man, actually. Uh, that's his parents. They look rather stern. Um, but they were quite a liberal family. Uh, they were churchgoers, but his mother uh, didn't feel the necessity for uh, a god, an almighty, which is very critical in the way Heckel treated religion and treated the, um, the church. He was born 1934, died uh, 1919. His early education was very liberal. Uh, his parents wanted him to be a medic. Uh, they sent him to Würzburg, which was the leading medical uh, university establishment at that point in time in Germany. And critical there was this medical course taught people to learn by observation, which is quite different to many medical courses where it was all learning by rote. And so he there was taught microscopy, interpretation of images under the microscope. So it was a very, very good training for him. Uh, his career, very briefly, after finishing medicine, uh, he went to Yale University where he had a professorship. I think he was 28 at the time or something, quite young. Uh, and he stayed there for the rest of his career, although he traveled about quite a lot. Um, in that time in... Um, when he was doing his medical degree, he actually moved to um, Berlin for the second part of it. Uh, he was very influenced by uh, one of his teachers, Gregenbar. And it's Gregenbar who actually set him off, just by accident, on his career and his sort of, uh, his, his particular uh, route he was going to go. And it begins with, uh, initially, a rather fruitless uh, field trip to Italy. Greg and Barr invited him to go along with him, but had to pull out, so Heckel was left on his own. Oh yes, the other thing that Heckel did quite a lot, he did these travelling road shows, 
You get similar images for, for Huxley did the same sort of thing. I don't know how well you can see it from there, but you can see the sort of skeletons of apes and such like the uh, up here is the sort of classic progress of man. There's actually a wonderful cartoon now out on um, uh, someone who we'll encounter in, the, in, in this lecture, the, one of the presidential, one of the American presidential candidates. Uh, and uh, they have here is, um, oh, what's he called? The, uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and it moved towards uh, this end, <laughs> where is, there is a presidential candidate going along on four, uh, four limbs. <laughs> um, so, uh, right. Yet the American cartoonists are having a wonderful time with uh, Bush. This, all this diagram I really want to show is the black blobs. You, the text, uh, you don't really need to spend time on it on. I won't give you time to do it. What, the, the point I want to make for this is this period, no, go on, this period in the 19, 1860s uh, is a critical time, and that's when he was at the peak of his career. Things which are absolutely fundamental, like uh, cell theory, which is about here somewhere, in the 30s. The idea that the, an, an organism was composed of cells, not just a lump of organisms, you say, was brought out in that period uh, and gave rise to a whole lot of thinking and uh, arguments that would run along from it. Uh, Mendel, obviously, um, ideas came out then, um, and some other things as well, which I don't really want to spend time on. Um, and the yellow is his lifespan there. So we're right in the middle. It's a very, very dynamic time. I think you can argue in biology, conceptually, the advances were greater then. They may be more impressive now, but the actual advances were greater then than they are what, uh, in what we've been through in the last 50 years. But we could argue about that over many beers. He, coming back to the field trip, he went to Naples. That wasn't uh, built at that point in time. It's just a way of putting Naples up on the board. Uh, and Fernie was getting nowhere. He was getting samples coming in. He, he, he just really couldn't do very much with them. And he threw in the sponge and disappeared off to uh, Ischia, the island in the Bay of Naples. And he met up with a poet and an artist. It's not a very good photograph. I think it's a wonderful face. <laughs> it's not the sort of face you'd like sitting in front of you if you were actually applying for a job, is it? <laughs> He'd frighten the pants off you, wouldn't he? <laughs> he was a poet as well, but I, I can't imagine he wrote love poems. <laughs> they, they drifted around like a, a bunch of, a couple of bohemians swimming and drinking and I'm sure many other things as well. Uh, eventually, oh, and painting, and that's one of uh, Heckel's watercolours, and he was a very accomplished artist. Um, they... Uh, went down to, he was scheduled to go to Messina uh, in Sicily, and so they eventually bimbled their way down to that, and then uh, Almers had to go home. Um, and uh, so Heckel really had to get down to what he was supposed to be doing. So he used to go down to the fish gate at five o'clock in the morning and see what the fishermen brought in. And this is where it started, and what he was finding uh, so I don't, they must have been dragging up sediment samples, I don't quite know, it doesn't, none of the texts explain what sort of samples he received, but, you know, they're radiolarians most likely, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be using plankton nets, uh, so they must have come from the sediments. Now Heckel looked at these, uh, and what he did, these are just a mass of them put together, Heckel saw the development of form in it. Um, and uh, I've got uh, a little video which I hope will play, um, which in a way, in a very clever way, it's from a film called Proteus. Um, yes, that's right. So, okay, this was published as De Radiolarum, which we've actually, we have in the library, or you have, Liverpool University has in the library here. We looked at that earlier on. There is a film about Heckel. It's a very good film, made by, uh, by uh, an uh, American director, uh, Philip Lebrun, and this, it places Heckel in the ancient mariner uh, role, sort of thing, it mixes the two together, and it shows this development of form, Now I'm hoping it will play. You can hear the music, can you? Just about. <laughs> 
And these are actual forms. I thought at first they were morphs, but I put it on step mode and it is actual forms. So he was seeing this transition. Um, and there was at that point in time, and we're talking now about 1859, it's a rather crucial date to remember. Yeah? Uh, there was a philosophy uh, called uh, morphologism, which was that the uh, species were not fixed in form. Linnaeus argued that they were fixed in form. They were created by the Almighty and they were fixed in form. The morphologists had this uh, philosophy called transcendentalism, which was nothing about, as far as I know, it was nothing about smoking pot. Uh, it was about the change in form of these organisms. But there were three things that I, I found they, couldn't, they had to answer and they didn't have the answer for. What drove the process? Yes? What determined the, per the final perfect form? Was it the Almighty? And what determined the original form? Again, was it the Almighty? Depends on your philosophy. And as I say, Heckel did this work in 1859, which is the same year a gentleman in uh, Kent published the Origin of Species. That was translated into German the following year. And it answered two of those questions. Uh, first, it led to a break from this immutability of, of species of Linnaeus. What drove the system environmental change? Very simple. What determined the final perfect form? There was no final perfect form. It just wor worked for that particular circumstance. Who or what determined the original form? Was it the Almighty? Mm, and that's a problem. And they didn't have an answer for that. But someone thought it had an answer uh, in a couple of years' time. A couple of years later, uh, Huxley was looking at samples collected. Some, many of you will know this story, but for those who don't, I'll run through it. We're looking at samples that had been collected some 10 years earlier, sediment samples, that were preserved with alcohol. And this was published in 19, 1858. And that was the same year that Huxley presented a paper describing protoplasm. So uh, he had the notion of protoplasm and the form of protoplasm there in his mind. And in these sediment samples, or on the surface of these sediment samples, he saw this form, which he called Bathybios, and he named after Heckel. Uh, and so it was born in 19, 1868 by Thomas Huxley. The Challenger expedition, one of their jobs was to document this and find its distribution. Well, they didn't find it at all. They spent, I mean, the, the Chandra expedition ran for virtually three years. Uh, and it was about one and a half years through that the chemist, Buchanan, uh, took a bottle of sediment, uh, put alcohol in it, uh, then looked at it under the microscope and found that bathybios was simply a precipitate of uh, calcium sulfate. So it was a complete artifact. Uh, Huxley didn't give a damn. <laughs> he made the same point, that false hypothesis uh, is every bit as good and sometimes more important than no hypothesis at all. He just brushed it off. Uh, and I think quite rightly so. I mean, it, he was rather cautious over the claims. Heckel, on the other hand, took it and ran with it. Uh, was a little bit upset with Huxley. Um, but eventually, he himself had to, had to give in. Uh, so that was the end of that. Now, um, I want to talk about three philosophical movements that, again, were running at that time, more general ones, because out of that comes a, a matter which I'll talk about later on. And you had two extremes. Uh, one, it's about the, the biosphere, shall we say. One, which I think Heckel called dualism, that came from, interestingly, René Descartes, a mathematician, is there were two things, spirit and matter. And if you had that, you could accommodate the soul, you could accommodate uh, consciousness. You could accommodate spiritual things. The materialists took, uh, materialists took the extreme opposite view, that there was only matter and energy, of course. Um, and they had problems with consciousness, and they had problems with the soul. 
Uh, and that debate ran on. There's a rather nice book by Schrodinger called What is Life? And he was struggling with a couple of things. One was he was struggling with the code for the reproduction of organisms and actually developed a code on, nucle on uh, protein, uh, amino acids rather than nucleic acids. But he also struggled with this business of consciousness. Um, and uh, Haeckel put forward what he called monism, which was between the two, uh, it somehow accommodated consciousness without being spiritual. Uh, Heckel wasn't too sold on the soul because the problem with that is if you take the traditional uh, circumstance that the soul is supposed to be exclusive to man. And of course, if you have an evolutionary process, the question is at what point did the Almighty dump it in men? Shall we say? And, uh, but Heckel took it even further backwards and he argued uh, that even the smallest of organisms had this ability to learn and pass on information. And he invented, uh, and he regarded this as something associated with the material part of the cell. Uh, and uh, he dreamt up uh, a concept of psychoplasm, which was where the, all this memory was stored. And it struck me, if you look in one of his books, he has a little heading, which is the so psychology of radiolarums. This, <laughs> this sounds something like a Monty Python sketch, you know. Now come in, Mr. Radiolarum, <laughs> what's wrong with you? I'm in a deep position. <laughs> um, but really, you could argue it was DNA. I mean, that is the message that's passed on, and that's what he was looking for. So maybe I shouldn't ridicule it. Uh, the reason I mention monism at this point uh, is that monism was a very active movement in the late 1800s, up to about 1930, uh, in Germany. And, in, 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 and it was wide, widely spread as well, both in the United Kingdom and America. Um, right. <clears throat> um, and the monists turned to um, eugenics. And it's really this, uh, and Heckel, if you like, started this monist movement over, and Heckel sort of got the blame for this, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll encounter this later on. Um, now, uh, first thing I want to talk about uh, of the first book is a book he published uh, 1866, two volume book, 1,500 pages long. He wrote it in 12 months. Uh, it's a phenomenal output. Um, and this is very crucial. It's the sort of tree of life, shall we say. And um, this is, Heckel used a lot of these. Uh, he, Darwin also began to use them, but Darwin was no artist whereas Heckel uh, drew these himself. And at first there's nothing sort of striking about it. Uh, it had the two branches, plants and animals. But there was a third branch, which was called the protista. Now, the protista is now used very extensively in the classification of plants and animals, but it completely fell out of uh, use uh, in between these two times. We'll have a look at the progression. And just while I've got it up, stem cell comes from the cells along the stem. He's got his organisms branching off it. And the notion was that the stem cell was something central to the core of development. Uh, and of course, that I think is very similar to uh, the way we look at stem cells now. Um, if you go to Wikipedia, they, they show a progression of ideas of... Um, of, of classification of the kingdoms. And uh, you can see that Protista is there. And if you take, look up a bit, the Monera are there. And perhaps one could take a liberty and take that out and put it as a group. If you do that, um, we had moved from Linnaeus's idea to Heckel's idea. Uh, and then you could argue it was another hundred years before there was a significant change 
uh, in the overview of the uh, whole living kingdom. And that, oddly enough, uh, so we go forward to, um, uh, where is it, uh, 1966. And the addition then was just the putting in of the fungi. And that isn't really a major step. So there was enormous conceptual advance that Heckel made, but really it got lost. It just got put to one side, like a lot of good theories. Uh, you know, plate tectonics, uh, Malinkovich cycle, all sorts of things were discharged and then re rediscovered again. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called the, well, I'm not going to try the German. <laughs> uh, it, it was translated the natural history of, uh, it was, the translation is the natural history of creation. When it was translated into English, uh, a professor at London University, Ray Lancaster, said to him, and I love this, uh, he said, I think we should leave out natural history because it will offend the pious English. <laughs> so that's put us in our place, hasn't it? <laughs> um, and in it, there are three things I'm going to pick out of it. First is about the evolution of man. Secondly is the discovery of the so-called missing link, uh, which was known as the Java man, which apparently was an elderly lady. A oh, well, very elderly lady, I suppose, if you think about it. Uh, and thirdly, uh, I have to get into some embryology and also the accusations of fraud, right? And that's where the story becomes very messy. The evolution of man, it's an interesting story, this. And I start off with uh, another person who was a professor at um, Jena University, Schleister. And he was a linguist. And it was interesting, he was a very close friend of Heckel. And Schleister had already published a theory of the evolution of languages based on survival of the fittest in 1854. <coughs> uh, so it came out before Darwinism, but in a completely different field. Now, you won't be able to uh, make much sense of the diagrams. I'm going to lead you through them. They're in old German script. Uh, but Heckel used two properties to generate this diagram diagram. One was linguistics and the other one to me was completely surprising is hair form. And his argument was that hair form wasn't uh, conditioned extensively uh, by environmental conditions. So it was a more fundamental property than many others. And the first separation was into woolly hair and uh, into woolly hair and the other side we'll look at it was straight hair. And interesting, apparently, the woolly hair is oval in form. I didn't know that. The other side was the straight hair, which is circular in form. Now, I couldn't resist having some fun with this, because I... I, I <laughs> so, uh, it, it occurred to me that subsequent to Heckel's time, there have been some developments. Uh, <laughs> another branch <laughs> from the... <laughs> Uh, and, of course, it led on to... Uh, no, actually, chronologically, it didn't lead on to this, because that, I think, was in the 60s, and that was in the 70s. But you, we often get our chronology wrong in geology. Now, the question is, where do we put these? You know, do we put them at the top of the tree or the bottom of the tree? What we've missed out is the linguistics, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, there was another branch more recently, the, the mob heads. Uh, no, we have one... <laughs> yes? As I say, the American political cartooners are having an absolute field day. I could have put up a dozen of these. And of course we have one in Britain, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was in the Daily Mail. Reputedly, the orangutan broke in and complained, with, <laughs> complained about the associate. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, to, to go on to the migration of man. Now, Heckel produced this map, 1866, about the migration of man. Much of it, I think, was just pure invention. But there were uh, some sound parts to it. He had this continent, which was supposed to be a sunken continent, called Lemura. And it was based on sound principles. I, I, I speak somewhat cautiously, because I'm looking over at Paul and some of the other uh, geologists here. But it was, I think, part of the Indian plate. Uh, they thought it sank, but it didn't. And it's about the species you get in... Um, Oh, what's it called? Madagascar, which are not related to the African species. And he saw a migration route running through there. 
uh, and said that Java would be a place to look for uh, the link, the early stages of man. And lo and behold, uh, some years later, what is it, about uh, ten years later, uh, one molar, one femur on the top of a head uh, was found by a um, René Dubois, who was a Dutch uh, medical army physician. He was supported by uh, 50 conscripted convicts uh, and uh, two sergeants with rifles. <laughs> um, and they, they spent four years uh, hunting for this. So they must have moved a phenomenal quantity of soil uh, to dig up these remains, which they presume came from a single individual. Uh, I presume that they didn't find anything else there, so it must have come from a single individual. So, um, that was something where Heckel's predictions came out to be right. He was very interested in embryology, uh, and this is where we run into this whole business of, what am I doing, Matt? Left or on? Uh, <laughs> I thought you'd be... Better. Okay, it's a, I'm, I'm sort of okay, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, he published a, 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 a number of works on embryology. I was very interested in it. Um, the first came out when it, he made a trip to Lanzarote with uh, an interesting character, a Russian actually, who was a bit of a, uh, a con man. He left... Uh, Jena with considerable debts. Uh, they were bitten to death by, in, they went to Lanzarote, they were bitten, I think it's changed since then, they were bitten to death uh, by bedbugs and such like. He worked on this rather poorly known group, the um, siphonophores. But what he was doing, he was taking the stem cells and separating them at an early stage, maybe once they divided in, into two and then seeing how they developed. If you didn't separate them, they developed into an organism. If you separated them, and what we see here is where he separated them, where he separated them into three, and where he separated them, and they developed differently. Now, he didn't pursue this, but this is really the sort of thing that we're doing when we're going ears on not ears on mice, but we're trying to grow organs and such like. So this work uh, was quite advanced in its time. And as I say, I came across this paper, published 2014, which you may not be able to read it here, but it, it acknowledges his work as a pioneer work in, in uh, stem cell research. So I think that's quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Now, the embryology story is an interesting one. At the time that Heckel was learning his biology and learning his medicine, there were two philosophies about uh, the way the embryo developed. One was, took the name predetermina predeterminationism, it's probably four times as long in German, I suspect, uh, and that was the embryo was in a perfect, perfectly formed in the egg, and then it just grew bigger. Yeah? Uh, and the other one was that you started off with the egg, and then the end embryo developed in complexity. Um, this one has the obvious problem that uh, you've got to have a very small organism develops, but this organism gives rise to the next one, so the next one must be in this one. So you get the Russian doll problem. Uh, so you could say, well, that doesn't make much sense. But at the same time, if you look at this, which is, of course, the one that we accept at the present, we know it is right at the present, um, getting embryos is very, very, was very difficult then, extremely difficult. Um, you know, the, the, a, a doubter would say, are you telling me that in a single microscopic cell there's all the information you need to build an organism with all of the organs in it? And I... I have difficulty, even now actually, making a convincing argument for that. So both of them, I think, were open to questioning. But this one, event, the, the, this one was eventually discarded and they went on to the one there. What Heckel did in this is there was an issue of what was going on 
and how these organisms develop these intermediate stage. And he produced a classic diagram, so that one went out, uh, which looked like this. And if you look at this, at the top, you have uh, organisms which are looking... Well, let's start at the bottom. Here you have a range of organisms, from fish here to man here, right? Um, and that's a sort of gradient in similarity. And it's an evolutionary associated trend. Um, in that direction, you have the development of the embryo. And what Heckel... Uh, I mean, I've simplified this. What Heckel was saying, that's called a phytogenic stage. I don't know whether I need to use that word. What Heckel argued is that as evolution went on, different organisms peeled off at different times. So that, whoops, uh, so this organism, yeah, this organism had that amount to develop in the embryo, this one had that amount to develop, this one had that amount. It's a nice theory. Uh, and it was called on ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Eventually, it was found to be not entirely correct. It was an oversimplification. Um, oh, right. Yeah, we have to go back and deal with this. I'll come to um, what went wrong with it in a, in a minute. In doing this, he had to redraw uh, a number of uh, original um, drawings of, uh, of, of uh, embryos. And he had to rescale them and alter them. And he overdid the uh, arrangements of the diagrams to fit the theory, uh, just to put it crudely. And his worst instance of this is the so-called uh, three sandals. This is an early stage. It's a stage where I think this is a notochord developing there, where the, where the spine develops. Um, and he had done, if you compare the young embryos of chick uh, turtle and, and uh, the dog, you can't tell the difference between the two. Well, a embryologist at uh, Baal University said, not surprising, they're all the same. Uh, and they were all copied from the same woodcut. This fellow went over it. And of course, with the woodcut, you can see the grain of the wood as well. Yeah? Um, and he said, you're playing the, a game of three-card Monty with the public and, and science. Uh, Heckel really just said, um, and he, said, he put one up in the next edition, which was a year later, and said, here's one. You couldn't tell whether it's a fox, a chicken, <laughs> or a, a turtle. He, he didn't actually acknowledge, it was no mea culpa. He simply said, oh, that doesn't make any difference. You know, the story's much the same. Uh, but no one, he wasn't forgiven for this. Uh, and this was Heckel's problem, I think. He was very stubborn and very determined. Um, the... His original theory uh, was modified, not in part, because, not directly because of that. There were other bits of evidence that didn't support it. Oops. Um, and uh, what it said was that there was a parallel development. So it wasn't that ontogeny recapitulates ph phylogeny, <coughs> is it parallels phylogeny. Uh, and so the organisms had slightly different tracks. 40 minutes. OK, so I'm going to... I'm going to... Lit I think I'll actually... Yeah, no, I think I'll go... I'll skip the rest of the embryology and go on to the oceanography, because it's in a way interesting. Oh. We've got to listen to this. We've got to listen to this. <laughs> no. How do I... How do I get it going? I've got to press something. Let me see if this does it. No. OK. Forget it. Forget it. Hover the mouse over and click it. Sorry? What, over Oh, right. I see. Yeah. Can you hear it? Fueled it. 
And so to speak, I guess you could call it the science that fueled it. It's not really science, it would probably be falsely so called. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, that runs for another hour if you're interested. <laughs> At least it says so on the thing, I, I can assure you that... Uh, now I'm going to jump on, because I've... Um, I want to talk a little about this argument between um, Henson and Heckel. Um, the uh, Germans set up a, a major oceanographic expedition in 1889, and it was set up because the argument was put that other nations were doing it, it's time that we got Rhone own and did it. And uh, they sailed... Uh, a figure of eight course in the North Atlantic. Quite a small ship, actually. She was um, 850 tons or something like that, so quite a small ship. Um, and uh, Heckel was damning in his criticisms. He wasn't invited along, which might explain quite a lot. Um, but uh, his argument was it was a whole pile of rubbish and it was completely unreliable. And there were a whole series of other objections that he raised. I'm going to have to move through this quite quickly. But the truth is, although uh, the, the Henson used vertical net holes, uh, and Heckel said that you can't do this because the, the organisms are so unevenly distributed, you won't learn anything from it at all, and the results will be nonsense. If you look at the, the kites, the, the, the diamonds on the right-hand diagram, uh, they give you an idea of the size of the population. And uh, really, it gives quite a good uh, representation uh, of this map I got from uh, Mike Berenfeld. It's of uh, productivity. At the same time of year, of course, not the same year, at the same time of year as um, their cruise. It was, it was July to... Um, November. Um, the uh, Heckel also criticised the idea that he was using an oversimplistic notion of the food web, where there were, where if you could identify the scale of one level in the food chain, you could transfer it to another level, which was a very significant paper brought out by John Ryther in uh, 1969. So I think Heckel was wrong there as well. Um, one of the very interesting things is that um, he, there was debate that the challenger people also uh, debated whether the food chain, the food for the higher uh, organisms was in situ production or uh, internal, sorry, uh, run off from land. Heckel argued that you simply couldn't support the demands of the fish from small organisms. Um, and I think, in part, there's a justification for this because we didn't really understand what the biologists know as the classical most of the elephant curve uh, until about the 1930s. Um, and I think if that's the sort of relationship between metabolism and size. If you take specific metabolism, that is, you divide the um, rate of metabolism by the weight of the organism, you get a negative slope with a slope of minus 0.25. And if we go to the oceans and we do a diatom to the whales, you get a thing like that. Uh, and the difference in rate of metabolism between the whales and the dolphin is uh, something in the order of 300,000 fold. And if you go down another order of magnitude of the bacteria, it's close to a third of a million. Uh, it's quite staggering. And there is, there is a thing from this which... I find very difficult to believe, but it stands up to the maths, is that organism is one of the most sluggish organisms in the ocean. Now, it's very hard to grasp that. The thing that's worth knowing, it only expends one horsepower. A whale, a large whale, is only about five to ten horsepower. Their, their, their metabolism is, they would boil uh, if they produce more energy. If a whale had the same metabolism uh, as a bacterium, uh, it would be the temperature of the sun. I mean, you can calculate this from Stefan Boltzmann's law. Uh, <laughs> and so it would just explode. So, so uh, we have a very poor... Uh, uh, the, I, don't, 
I have no intuition for this at all. It seems wrong to me, but the mass is right, says he, crossing his fingers. OK, I want to just finish with getting up the nose of the Brits. Uh, he was having a go at the church at this point in time. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. And he follows his arm. When some unscrupulous scoundrel, you can guess who that's going to be, has defrauded you of half thy goods, let him have the other half. When the pious English take from you simple Germans, one after the other, uh, of the colonies in South Africa, let them have the rest. Uh, and, <laughs> and while we're on, uh, we touch on the marvellous war of politics of that nation. They, con they contradict every precept of Christian charity. Well, there we go. <laughs> but as I say, the empire struck back. <laughs> In the London Times announcement, he wasn't given an obituary in any of the English newspapers. And uh, a colleague of mine are planning to remedy that. Uh, his uh, 100 years of his death is in three years' time now. Uh, and we're going to write an obituary for uh, The Guardian and see if they'll, they'll publish it. But anyway, this is what... The, you can't read this. This is what... I'm going to blow up a bit of it. This is what The Times reported at the time. Uh, and it's this section here, which starts off, if Heckel had died 19 years ago, he would have uh, secured a more honourable place in English memory. Yeah? Which means, you might choose, it would have been much better if he had died 19 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> which I can't think of a bigger damnation. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It's about on time, is it?